Hello, uh, thanks a lot everyone uh, for coming. This is a bit of a weird rambly talk. I hope uh, it has a point for you. But yeah, I, 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 the, the title of the talk is Art for Tech People and the idea is a weird reframing about my experience of coming into the visual art world from more of a programming uh, background and how, how that uh, impacted me and how I, I think about art and my process for making art for games. Uh, and yeah, I mean, just a little bit of presentation. I'm Ferran Rizala, known as Rain Drinker Online. I'm a game programmer and designer. Um, and I've, I've become a little bit of like an accidental artist and pixel artist. I started dabbling and because of indie reasons, having to do game jams, landing in some indie companies, I've had to take it a bit more seriously. And I ended up teaching pixel art even like at, at uh, college-like level uh, together with programming and I make some silly little games we will talk about slightly at the end. I will block slightly. So yeah, um, I mean thinking about visual art as a programmer, if you've not had like a formal art education or you've not dabbled a lot in it, it's very scary. You know, there's, there's some general advice that you will get. I, I just put these three lines here. I don't think this is bad advice i don't i just don't think it's very useful so this talk is kind of an exercise in reframing this in a way that i feel is more helpful to tech-minded people uh, take everything i say with a huge grain of salt this is very my experience my opinion kind of thing and it might not work for for some kinds of people but i just think there's some interesting ideas there about how to think about making art or learning art or becoming better at it and having a bit of an eye for art, I guess. Uh, the first one is this one, no? just have talent slash or practice. Uh, people will say, no, you don't need talent. You just need to practice. It doesn't matter which one of the two you do. This, at the end of the day, it just sounds like get good. You no, know? like they're just telling you, you either have to have some fundamental quality or you need to do something through time to gain it. And it, I don't think it's very actionable. Uh, this this is a speed paint. No, we we go online and we see someone doing a speed paint. This is his mindset. I guess this is a bit of a flex, though. I don't think it's amazing. It's just good because I I'm I'm not that like I'm relatively new to the world of art. But yeah, you see speed paints like this online, and you just go, okay, that looks good. But you you don't see it as a stack. You don't see it as a process. You don't. You, you can't really catch the choices. There's obviously choices here made by the artist, but they're fast and they're very flowy, obviously, that this is sped, sped up. No? So in a sense, it, it, it can just feel like this. Whenever you go online and you see art tutorials, it feels a bit like the how to draw an owl meme. No? Like one, draw some circles, two, draw the rest of the fucking owl. Like there's, there's a lot of choices in here, like a lot of technique, a lot of ideas that are just lost in the sauce and a lot of art tutorials are about how to make a specific thing and that's not i mean obviously if you make specific things a lot of times you end up with some general knowledge but it's not the most useful and it's very frustrating uh, to try to imitate and follow like recipes because it, it's basically like telling someone who's learning programming this you know like one write some conditionals this is how an if works and two code the rest of the game like it, we're to obviously talking about very different layers. It's true that a game is made of code and the game has a lot of conditionals in it and you need to know the conditionals to make the game, but it's not the conditionals. Like there's a whole other layer here that's that's being lost. This is like to our fortress, I choose it because it's a very, I guess, programmer focused, uh, programming focused game. So yeah, just first step of reframing is let's not talk about practicing and having talent. Let's talk about making better choices. But that still is a bit of like a get good. What does it mean for a choice to be better? Uh, so my next step is always to suggest if we have to make better choices, let, let's instead commit to making less choices. Because if I make less choices, I, may, I can make each of those choices more interesting, more intentional, uh, and more aware of them. Like I don't, I don't want to rely on my intuition because if, if I'm a programmer, I, I probably don't have a lot of good visual artist intuition, and that's something that you need to develop through the years. So I, I'll just try to make less choices and make them with more, more intention. So I, I'm, I guess I just suggest that you overthink stuff. Uh, as a pro if, if you are a programmer, you know how much programmers overthink code. And we sometimes think that artists do not overthink their art that much. That's a kind of 
magical divine inspiration thing and there's some of that but some of a lot of that is just subconscious there's an, a, a lot of layers of overthinking i mean every artist will be different but i think for programmers actively overthinking stuff can be very very helpful i mean overthink has a negative connotation to it but you get what i mean by overthink i just mean being specific being intentional having like a specific purpose in mind every time you make a choice and make choices that are big and there's breathing room between the choices and you can see them as individual choices and like study them almost. Uh, this is in red because this is obviously false. Uh, I'm trying to make an analogy. Uh, if, if you are a programmer and I tell you like that the mark of a good programmer is that their code runs correctly on the first try, you would tell me that I hope that most programmers would tell me that, that, that I'm crazy, like this makes uh, no sense almost. And I've even, I'm, I'm willing to flip it completely. Like my take would be that the mark of a bad programmer is that they expect their code to run correctly on the first try. I, I teach programming and I teach pixel art and uh, I, can, I can make that parallel very confidently. I'm surprised how willing students are to code lines and lines and lines of code and not press the play button once. Uh, because they that's what they imagine like a good programmer does and I have to repeat them no every time I write a line of code I almost always I just press the play button and I doubt myself I overthink stuff I check stuff constantly so I can apply that same logic to art no like the, the mark of a bad artist is someone who expects expects their art to look perfectly on the first try expects all the pixels to land on the correct place uh, magically and never have to to overthink it and go through it and redo and I mean, the, the conclusion of this is like that, in my mind at least, surprisingly, which might seem counterintuitive, masters are almost always more willing to restart, retry, and throw away work than beginners are. Beginners have this pressure to land the plane on the first try and to not be willing to really overthink and go through it and look at the details. Uh, you might agree more or less with this, but I, I really think it's a relatively it might be very obvious to you but to, to me it's a kind of like a counterintuitive uh, discovery that um the more people throw away their art the more people doubt their, doubt their art that's more correlated with skill than with lack thereof i guess uh, the second thing i had in this in those three first uh quote unquote bad advice is that feedback and critique and i just mean like people that will say you have to receive feedback and critique you have to look at your own art also critically and try to feedback it yourself but what what does that even mean like how is this actionable am i just showing my art to people and asking is this good like am, am i doing this am i am i hoping for for my my mom to put the art on the fridge no is is how how can i get anything from this uh, we tie our personal value to the value of our art a lot more than than usual uh, so there's a weird dynamic there, and th th this is an idea that I, I find interesting, and we'll see if, if you if you guys agree. But uh, I, I found this this kind of posts on Twitter. This is from someone who's very professional, uh, but there's examples with people who are more more uh, beginners, which is someone posting a character and going like, make an assumption about this character, and I'll tell you if you're right. No, that's a bit of like. Um, uh, a little game that people play with their followers as, as artists. And at some point it just went, wait, this is just someone going, please, could you compile this in your machine and tell me what kinds of warnings, errors, things show up? Like, this is debugging. Like, this is someone debugging their art. In this case, it's someone who's very professional and probably want to understand if someone tells them something they didn't expect, they won't take it as, oh, I need to fix this. But when I've been doing art for, for games, I found it extremely useful to have some piece that I did and show it to someone and say, what comes to mind? Like, please run this art, I guess, in your own machine, your brain, and tell me what kind of things come up. I won't ask them, like, is this good? Do you like it? You can do that, like that's feedback, and probably the other person will give you useful advice uh, apart from yes or no. But this, this shift in mentality of, I have this piece of art that I want to um, achieve a specific reaction other than this is good, this is bad. I'll show it to people and see if their reaction aligns with, the, with what they expected. And 
kind of making the parallel between that and the process of debugging code, uh, running code and seeing if the output that, that shows up is the one that you expected, made me have like a different relationship to producing art in a more, I need to make art for this product in a more um, tactical way, I guess. I don't know which, which one is the word. But yeah, there's there's this other example. It's not quite the same, but it's related where there's this trick you know, that artists use. This is fake. This is not the actual same picture flip where they say, oh, you have to flip your canvas every now and then to break your familiarity with the picture and realize that your anatomy is wrong. And artists love this trick because when you're doing art, you don't have a lot of quick tricks that you can apply to test if something is working. That's something that we're very used to having in programming. We have testing, we have debugging. I can add like a print in my code to see what's going on. We don't have a lot of that in art. So when artists find a little trick like this, they, they love it. Like they recommend it. They, it's very useful. It's something very actionable. And I, I see that as almost like artists engaging with their art in a tech-like manner for a second, and they can get a lot of benefit from that. So if you come from tech, you can try to think more in that sort of framework. Uh, it's just it's just an example no but uh wait i i reordered this slightly but yeah um i mean w one of the conclusions is and this slide is a lot of discourse it's a bit like tricky to convey what what i mean but um i don't agree quote unquote with how this image of the curtains were blue you might be familiar of it it has created a lot of discourse is being used like i agree with part of it but I think it's very important for people making art, any kind of art, uh, visual art or otherwise, to intend stuff when they're making the art and to interpret intention from the art. That doesn't mean that there's an interpretation that's correct, which is kind of what this image is criticizing, like a teacher that says the interpretation must be this and you, you say otherwise you're wrong. But I also don't agree with the curtains were fucking blue for no reason, like artists, make things intentionally and even when something just came out slightly randomly it has reason like someone had to write that word blue like it, nothing is random the the chair you everyone is sitting on at some point it was a blueprint on someone's hands and they had to actually decide the the length of every piece of the chair nothing is random everything has an intention behind and your work as an artist is to intend and to interpret intention very intentionally i guess uh, so yeah what what i'm suggesting is the reframing of have feedback and critique instead of talking about just feedback and critique and asking is something good or bad we want to think in a problem solving manner in a i guess thinky puzzle programming techy manner i think that's useful it might not be for some but i look at a piece of art and i go like what does this do does this work what does it need to do what does it want to do like um, there's there's a lot of distance between something being good or bad, which means not that much, and something being useful or something communicating a specific idea. And that's conversation that's much easier to have. So this is the reframing. No, we're not talking about receiving feedback and critique. We're talking about debugging art. We're talking about art as problem solving. And I, I, I think that's more useful to not attaching your personal value to your art and thinking, is this good or bad? It's just... Uh, easier way to think about the process. If you're going to be making lots of art, if you're going to be making a full game, you want to think about what do, do I want to get from this? Is it solving the problem I have? It might feel a bit less soulful, but I don't think it is. I don't think tech is soul, soulless. I don't think programming is soulless at all. So I don't see why thinking about art in a similar way makes it less valuable. So I, I think that's a useful framing. And the third one, and one that scares people a lot, is like the idea of developing a style. You're an artist, you have a game that you want to make. A game needs to have a strong style. You need to have a strong style. You cannot just be copying things. Uh, but as, as with the other advice, this feels not that actionable. Like, what, what does that mean? Does, does that mean that I just copy enough people where it's it's a mesh of everything and what what does this mean no and there's another reframing relating it to tech and to programming that i i came up here which i think might be useful and I, this is another like slightly controversial slide i guess but uh, i think you most programmers like 
that spent most more than like two years programming. If if I say programming is not about writing code that works, they will get what I mean. Like it obviously is, but it's also very much not. Like that's just the final layer. There's a lot of stuff on top. Uh, programming is. Yeah, I mean, what I tell to my students is like programming is not about getting the machine to understand you. That's a given. Programming is about getting other people to understand you and having a system, having a process. So I, I can apply the same logic to art, no? Like art is not about just making images that are nice to look at. And I, I apply the same logic that I applied in, in programming. And I added this little footer here where, uh, yeah, um, also given the, the, the advent of AI, uh, making code that works and images that are nice to look at it's a low bar to clear even if you don't think like uh, uh, ai art is beautiful I, I don't think that's interesting uh, ai art importantly like it's careless it's it's just nice to look at and we can do better than that uh, and we have to and it's interesting to try uh, so my point here is like everyone understands that you can write code that works. You have a layer up there that's like software architecture, or having a good framework, having like all these principles that programmers love to talk about, no? all these uh, things with acronyms and, and model view controller and like uh, whatever. There's tons of this. You, you get what I mean. Uh, but with art, we think about making art that looks nice as art. But the framework, I guess, or the system that gets you to make art that looks nice what is that like can we talk about art architecture and my kind of idea here is like this is what style is a style is a framework that gets you to making art that looks nice you can develop final art and you can develop your style you can develop your framework you can have a system um so this is kind of the the refraining reframing no like we're not talking about developing a style we're talking about developing a framework, uh, uh, which is your style, and which basically consists in any process you can trust, some some tools that you believe in, some system that you can follow uh, with some confidence, no? Um, whichever whichever it is, uh, developing a confidence in a, in a process. And uh, yeah, this is something that I also tell uh, students often, which is that in games, especially whenever you're making a big product, uh, consistency is a lot more valuable than quality, just like in programming. Having a good system or framework is a lot more valuable than any of the specific things it produces or any of its parts. And here I'm just going to go with some examples from games that I think kind of make that point from something like Pizza Tower, which I absolutely adore, but like any piece of art in this game by itself could be very rightfully considered considered messy or like unkempt, even ugly. And the game is absolutely beautiful because I, consistency is a lot more valuable than, than quality and care is a lot more valuable than quality. And there's clear intention of why they made this like this. It's not a random choice. It's it's not like this because of no reason. There's there's a lot of care and intention behind it, and it is felt. Uh, and even something like Squishcraft, which is a thinking game, you might know it. And it's it's it wore the fact that the programmer didn't know how to make art in its leaf and went. But this is what style is. This is what care is. Like there's still care behind this. There's an intention. There's a an, an idea behind the, the visuals of this game. And it really works even with everything. Uh, and I, that's that's what, what I mean with like the, the style, the consistency is more valuable than any specific asset that you end up making. Uh, which which comes to this, you no, know, like practicing art is not about finally making the image that will make everyone cry and it will make all your, your previous practice worth it. It's kind of about turning yourself into an art engine. Uh, in programming, you could be developing your game's engine, and then with it, you make a game. Uh, in art, you are the engine. I mean, you could include in that, like, oh, I found these cool brushes that I'm very confident in, or I decided to work in this specific medium where I feel really comfortable. That's part of the engine, but it's mostly about your confidence in some method, something that you can confidently do, and you know that you'll get a good enough result uh, consistently instead of just chasing um, just the image, the pure beauty, which is very fun to do, but it's not a way to 
develop a style, develop a framework for making for making art. Yeah, so this is the reframing basically. Instead of developing a style, we talk about style being your framework, finding a process you can trust, and squeezing whatever tools you like, even if it's not the best ones, if it's not the the most fancy ones, to force them to make art, to treat them with care. You no, know? and I have another example here from Thomas Was Alone. This is a game that's visually it, it doesn't have a lot of inspired strokes of the pen. This is a game made by someone who knows how to do lighting, uh, light, lighting in games, knows how to do shaders, knows how to do physics. So this the Vista Manifesto, it's like, just make art that's ugly but consistent, make art that's simple but clean and elegant, make art through shaders, through physics, through code-driven visuals. Like if you're a programmer, just treat those with the respect you treat a, mach a machine that can do art, like make art through control randomness and procedural noise and make any art that could not be held in a PNG that someone could cannot do like any speed paint. Like it's, it, you're using your personal tools to make visual art that you can give care to uh, and think, overthink it, like treat it with a lot of care and respect and give it time, make less choices, make less, more intense choices and make it make something interesting. And uh, what's the next slide? Yeah, uh, there's, there's this secret, this presentation is secretly about why I love pixel art because it aligns a lot with this stuff. If you actually wanna make PNGs, if you wanna make assets for a game, um, this is the reasons why I love pixel art and I just go quickly through them. Uh, fundamentally, like pixel art is very friendly to tech people. You don't need any masterful stroke. You don't need any intuitions. Uh, if you have a 10 by 10 canvas, those are just 100 choices you have to make. And if you make each of them intentionally, you're going to get some art at the other end. And you can think about each of those choices really easily. For example, these I have just, I want to make a flower. I have a 10 by 10 canvas. I have a bunch of colors. I restrict myself in the resolution. I restrict myself in the palette and I can make flowers. And I can think deeply about why I placed each of those pixels there. And that's very useful to develop this intuition that if you have not been doing art, since you were a child, um, otherwise you might feel like you're lacking. Uh, so that's that's what got me into into the mess of, of pixel art. Pixel art also has an insane amount of reliable shorthand rules and terminology that makes it a lot closer to programming, like things that they go like, oh no, this is, you should never do this. Like this is a jaggy and jag, jaggy lines are bad and you should avoid them. And those are rules that are very useful to start. And then later on you can uh, break them. Like I'm not a pixel art purist, there's enough of those. But yeah, um, there's a lot of, of procedures already set up, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of processes that are pre-made and you can follow. Uh, it forces you to limit yourself and make fina finite, finite and bold choices. Uh, you can restrict the palette and commit to a palette. You can restrict the resolution and commit to a resolution. This is uh, like print on a plant piece with just four colors. And it's so fun to work with less colors because you need to be so creative and use this, the same color that in one place is the shadow in the other place is something else. Like it's, it's very, it's very techy. Like you need to come up with solutions that are specific and just go pixel by pixel and be very careful. And th that's very fun to me. I don't know as a, as a previous programmer. And then it also forces you to be debugging your art constantly. Like it forces you into this cycle of like, I zoom in, I make some change. I zoom out and I evaluate what the hell happened. What changed? Like, do I want this change or not? This example with a character where I literally moved, I think, two pixels in the mouth, and just the the, the amount of expression change you can get from it, to me, is huge. Like, literally every other pixel in the image is the same. I made a very specific intentional choice, and I can decide like. Is the character that I want to make closer to the one on the right or the one on the left? And I can make that decision very intentionally. I just have to have time and get a little bit of speed of making those choices faster over time. But if you take enough time, you can make anything basically. And with that, uh, I can I can send I, I made a while ago for my students and I posted it on on Twitter like this pixel art compendium compilation of resources um that that i've used in the past or that i respect 
with some tutorials, some software recommendations, some websites and communities that do like pixel art daily, stuff like that, where if someone wants to dip their toes in pixel art, can, can look into it. I will post the link on the Thinky Discord if someone uh, wants it, or you can copy it here. I made like a short URL. Uh, and finally, uh, this is shameless plug. Uh, we just announced uh, Log Digital. The art in this game is not mine, but I it follows a lot of the ideas I have about art, about intentionality and being very bold and charming and intentional and brutal and minimalistic. And it's a, it's a little thinky puzzle game that I'm programming. Uh, it's an adaptation of a, of a puzzle book. Uh, and we have the demo on Steam, so you can go play it if you're interested. And uh, that's kind of it. Um, I, I have this pixel piece with Don't Forget to Love Each Other from Critical Role that I made a while ago just to close the presentation. And I, I hope it was useful. I, I always felt it was a bit rambly and that uh, it kind of has a point, but really doesn't. It says things that are both very obvious and very strange. Uh, I hope it added something to you. I will be answering any questions either here or in Discord. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I loved all your reframing of things into the tech perspective. It's super inspiring. Um, we don't have a, we don't really have any time for questions, really. And I think the one question did come up, sort of answered by your last slide. Uh, Mario was asking what software you recommend for people doing pixel art. Oh, a sprite. <laughs> A sprite? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, for pixel art, like, it doesn't have a competition. I know that's people who like using CSP for pixel art or even Photoshop, but to me, like, it's so honed for pixel art, a sprite, it's very hard to... It's not free, though, but I I, I mean, in my compendium thing, there's some free alternatives uh, that I, I try to gather, but I really recommend a sprite. Awesome. I need to try it myself. Uh, and thank you once again, Farhan. That was wonderful. Um, and.